Welcome to our Introduction to Cost Segregation and the Impacts of Tax Reform webinar. KBKG is headquartered in Pasadena, California, with additional offices in Illinois, Georgia, New York, and Texas. Since 1999, we have successfully conducted thousands of studies nationwide. KBKG's team has performed studies on facilities ranging in size from over 10,000 to over 1 million square feet, resulting in the deferral of hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes. We also have highly qualified engineering and tax professionals on staff. Our engineering department has extensive construction experience in reading plans and utilizing RF means and Marshall and Swift cost estimation techniques. Our tax department provides support for all cost segregation tax related issues, including 1031 exchanges, AMT, passive activity, abandonment write offs, and lease provisions. We are a preferred provider for thousands of CPAs across the country. Now, I will introduce our speaker, Harry Sahi. Harry is a manager with KBKG specializing in cost segregation, fixed asset services overseeing the Northeastern and West Coast regions. He has over six years of experience conducting cost segregation studies, ranging from auto manufacturing plants, hotels, heavy manufacturing industrial facilities, multi-million dollar offices, and residential complexes. He is also responsible for managing projects, training staff engineers, pursuing business development efforts, including direct client interaction by, issue, by issuing proposals and providing presentations on continued education. Harry graduated from Purdue University with a Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering, having an emphasis in construction and transportation. I'd like to now turn the presentation over to our speaker. Hello everybody from Pasadena, this is Harry. I trust everyone is doing well. Um, first things first, upon, upon completion of this course, you'll be able to explain what cost segregation is and how you can take advantage of it. Um, identifying some tax issues that should be considered in, in conjunction with the cost segregation study. Additionally, you know, you should be able to see what is the impact of the cost segregation study on the tax planning. And also, we will discuss uh, the impact of the tax reform um, it has, you know, on the cost segregation and also the cost segregation opportunities related to the tangible property regulations and the disposition regulations. Additionally, we will also talk about the new opportunities uh, that you will get immediately to, to deduct abandoned building components so you can avoid recapture tax and how you can expense the demolition cost. So looking at 30,000 feet, let's look at what kind of properties cost segregation studies can be done on. Majorly, you can do cost segregation study on acquired property, new construction, and remodel property and build out. Keep in mind, you can go as far back as 1987. However, the amount of depreciation you can take on an asset is limited to the asset basis. What does that mean? That means that cost segregation can accelerate the depreciation of an asset. It doesn't increase or decrease the amount that is to be depreciated over time. So although you can go as back as 987, a good identifier of a cost segregation benefit is the remaining basis left in a, in a property and how many years that are left to depreciate the property. Let's look at this graph, how cost segregation would impact an office building. Without a cost of study, the full cost of a building is recovered over 39 years straight line, as indicated by the red line in this chart. However, the purple line shows you how you can accelerate depreciation in the first few years. Basically, in this example, you can see 750,000 is depreciated over five or seven years and it produces a strong spike of depreciation in the first few years. And then it flattens out until 15 years when, until 15 year when the land improvements are fully recovered. Talking about the same example. So for so example of an acquisition of a $5 million office building, the basis can either be depreciated over 39 years without a cost segregation study or with the help of a cost segregation study, it can be segregated into five, seven, 
15 and 39 year recovery periods, resulting in an additional $930,000 of deductions over the first five years, and overall projected net present value benefit of $284,000 over the life of the project. It is important to know that all type of commercial and residential rental property are potential candidates for a cost segregation study. As much as I was talking about $750,000, keep the basis in mind, um, but it's essential that all types of commercial and residential rental property are a good candidates for a cost of study. What we have on the slide is a very general table that describes what cost segregation study could yield on an average for different types of facilities. You can see that um, obviously will, the amount of, it, it doesn't show you the personal property allocation, but it just shows you an average how much allocation that you can see. It could be higher on the lower end of the spectrum based on what kind of property you have. Keep in mind that we didn't break this detail down into individual recovery period, meaning five, seven, or 15 year property. Instead, we want to just show you an average person allocated in general so that you can see how these ranges can vary. Obviously, one big difference is going to be the amount of land improvements, which one property can have more and the other property can have less. So depending on whether you have 15 year property exists, you can find yourself on the lower end of the spectrum or a higher end of, uh, higher end of these ranges. So in this slide, um, I'm going to talk about some, some of the Section 1245 property examples. Section 1245 property is any new or used tangible or intangible personal property that has been or could have been subject to depreciation or amortization. Regulation Section 481C defines tangible personal property as any property except land, building, and structural components of the buildings and land improvements such as swimming pools, paved parking areas, etc. Tangible personal property includes all properties other than structural components, which is contained in or attached to a building. So this would include such property as production machinery, printing presses, transportation, and office equipment, etc. The picture on your screen represents a typical retail store like many of you have shopped at. Based on the observation in this picture, the items listed on the left are potential Section 1245 tangible personal property that could be depreciated over a five-year recovery period. And some of these examples are track lighting, decorative lights, lat wall paneling, and condors that you're looking at that picture. Now let's talk about Section 1245 personal property in, in, a, in a light of an industrial type environment. We commonly see um, lots of plumbing and electrical assets that can be considered as an accessory to the taxpayer's line of business. These are the activities which are rather than essential to the operation or maintenance of the building. These terms are general concepts that have been discussed repeatedly in court cases over many decades. In a cost segregation analysis, we rely on our expertise with the case law as well as our significant accumulated experience to determine which assets to go with the building as real property versus those that can be accelerated as tangible personal property. In an industrial building where some type of manufacturing is going on, it's common to see dedicated supply water and wastewater systems for the manufacturing process. It's also common to see heat and fume exhaust systems the manufacturing equipment usually has dedicated electrical switchgear and distribution systems. There can be an emergency generator or special cooling requirements, et cetera, in any of these industrial facilities which you can find and accelerate and take it as a 1245 property. Land improvements. Uh, when referring to land improvements, most tax professionals are thinking of asset class 00.3 from RepProc 87-56. Usually, typically, it's defined as any improvements that are directly added to land, whether such improvements are Section 1245 property or 1250 property, provided such improvements are depreciable. The asset class goes on to give examples of land improvements like sidewalks, canals, sewers, wharfs, et cetera. Most, for most taxpayers, the identification of land improvements is very helpful since they have a 15-year recovery period and are eligible for additional 50% bonus depreciation through 9-27-2017. And after that, it's 100% bonus after that, after that date. We'll talk more how land improvements have the, the effect of bonus 
um, in 2018 and so on and so forth. Now we'll jump on into tax considerations, things to look for um, in the light of cost seg. When considering a cost segregation study, we need to remember the following. Depreda depreciation deduction will reduce the alternative minimum tax. Bonus depreciation can apply to reclassified items in a cost segregation study of a new construction project. Any unused deductions can be carried forward to the future tax years. When a building is sold, the taxpayer or the seller must recap the depreciation taken on the tangible personal property. Accounting method changes are addressed with the Form 3115, which means you can retroactively address buildings from prior, from prior tax years. Passive activity rules can offset the benefit of a cost segregation study, and there are also certain 1031 exchange rules that need to be considered when you are considering to do a cost segregation study on your property. So let's talk about um, some other ta tax consideration in the light of personal property and its recapture. When a building is sold, the taxpayer or the seller must recapture depreciation previously taken on tangible personal property. The Section 1245 recapture is calculated at an ordinary tax rate of 39%, which leads us to recommend the holding period of, of at least five years when you're considering a cost segregation study. When a property is sold, the fair market value of Section 1245 personal property in a building may be uncertain. The seller can minimize recapture by allocating more of the sales, sale price to the real property instead of the personal property. In many situations, personal property in a building may have little to no value. For example, carpeting and certain other Section 1245 personal property installed a decade ago likely has minimal worth especially if a new owner has plans to replace it. In this case, it would be appropriate to allocate only a nominal amount, if any, of the building sale price to carpeting. So a proper valuation of personal property may yield lower overall recapture tax. Now let's look at the passive taxpayer self rental rule and grouping election. Many taxpayers have operating business entities that obtain a property and then rent it to themselves. This can be a great tax planning opportunity, but there are some issues with the self rental rule. And below are and some of these some of there are key facts that, that need to be kept in mind while you have this situation. A taxpayer that rents to a business in which he or she materially participates is a subject to self rental rule. The rental income from this activity is characterized as non-passive. Any related losses from the activity are always considered passive losses. What does it mean? Let me give you an example. So let's say if we have an LLC that owns the real property, and we are also 100% shareholder in an S-corporation operating entity that is leasing that real property. We also own some apartment buildings that have suspended passive losses. We may want to raise our rental rate to generate more revenue in the LLC that rents to the operating entity and offset that income against our suspended passive losses from the apartment buildings. However, this can't happen because the income from our self-rental activities is always going to be non-passive. And we can't offset our passive losses with non-passive income. If our self-rental activities have losses, those are going to be passive. So if we have passive income from other activities and we have passive losses from self-rental activities, we can offset those. Another thing that people often ask is what happens if I have passive losses at beginning of my self-rented activities and in a couple of years down the road, I get to a point where I have non-passive income. In that case, as long as it is related to the same property, you can offset that non-passive income against the prior passive losses on the, the same self-rental property. Again, 
you can offset prior passive losses from self-rental activities against non-passive income in a subsequent year from the same self-rental property. Here are a couple of, I'm gonna give you a couple of planning recommendations. Consider paying off any leasehold improvements from the operating entity. Also consider making a grouping election that allows activities to be grouped for tax purposes. The rental activity and the operations activity can be combined by making the selection to aggregate the activities. But the taxpayer can only make the election to aggregate the activities in the initial year. The taxpayer reports the activities. This election requires the attachment of a formal statement to the return. Now let's talk about the planning opportunity in a lease language. When you have a lease is how you can plan that out. A common scenario is for the cost of a tenant improvements to be partially shared by both lessee and lesser. Sometimes this can open the door for both parties to, to claim depreci depreciation deductions on the property with shortest recovery period. From the lessee perspective, it will always be preferable if the lease states the landlord's allowance is only for the 39-year property. This increases the lessee's ability to allocate more value to shorter life property. However, from the lessor's perspective, it would be preferable if lease states the allowance is for a pro rata share of all building components. This allows a lesser to accelerate depreciation on a portion of the 1245 components. Beginning after 9-27-2017, the 100% bonus depreciation rate is applicable to 2022. It's been scheduled to reduce by 20% 20, 20 each year after that. The bonus rates can be extended an additional year for long production period property and non-commercial aircraft. To qualify as long as production period property, an asset must have a recovery period of at least 10 years and be subject to Section 263A of Internal Revenue Code. And also have an estimated production period exceeding one year and production cost exceeding one million. And it must have been acquired subject to a written binding contract into prior to January 1st, 2028. Remember, the new law no longer requires that the original use of the qualified property begin with the taxpayer, as long as the taxpayer had not previously used the acquired property and the property was not acquired from a related party. The opportunity to take bonus depreciation on acquired property is a very significant benefit that taxpayers had never done before. So it's a, it's a pretty big deal for, for individuals with considering cost segregation that you can take bonus depreciation on used properties. The proposed regulation, section 1.168 K2, was issued on August 8, 2018, and it applies to the property acquired in, acquired in place and service after 9-27-2017. The proposed regs are in a 60-day common period, which has obviously passed. The taxpayer can, can rely, they can rely on those proposed regs, but they're not required to do so. To be eligible for the bonus depreciation, the property must be of a specified type the original use of it must begin with a taxpayer or the use property must meet certain acquisition requirements. Additionally, it must be placed in service by the taxpayer with a specified time period and must be acquired by the taxpayer after 9-27-2017. For the property acquired and placed in service prior to 9-28-2017, section 1.168 K1 generally, generally remains applicable. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act expands the qualified property eligible for a bonus to include not only the new property, but also the used property as well, as it was mentioned before. New property means the original use of the property begins with the taxpayer. In order for the used property to be eligible for bonus depreciation, it cannot have been used by the taxpayer prior to the acquisition. 
Also, it must, not, it must not have been acquired from a related party or a component member of a control group or in a certain carryover basis transaction. There are special rules for fractional interest that are distinguished between two separate scenarios. Let's say if a taxpayer owned a depreciable interest in a portion of the property and then subsequently acquires an additional depreciable interest in the same property, that additional interest is not treated as having been previously used by the taxpayer. What does it mean? Let me give you an example. A taxpayer could have a depreciable interest in their lease space in the form of leasehold improvements and then acquire the entire building and still meet the definition of bonus eligibility on that part which they didn't already own. If a taxpayer owned a depreciable interest in a portion of a property and then sells all or part of the portion, then subsequently acquires a different portion of the same property, the taxpayer will be treated as having owned previously the used property up to the amount of the portion in which it held depreciable depreciable interest prior to the sale. So for an example, if a taxpayer sold their 25% interest in a building and later on acquired 35% interest in the same building, they would only have a 10% interest in any bonus eligible property which was acquired. The series of related transaction rules states that property is treated as a directly transferred from the original transfer to the ultimate transferee and the relationship between the original transferor and the ultimate transferee is tested immediately after the last transaction is in the series. Now let's see how the tax reform and bonus depreciation affects on Section 74, 754 step up elections. So as long as there is a new partner coming in and the property has not been used by the taxpayer before, the step up can receive the new bonus depreciation. However, step, on, step up on debt is specifically excluded from the new bonus depreciation where property is received from a, de from a decedent. As I mentioned earlier, that the bonus eligible property must be of a specified type. This includes maker's property with a recovery period of 10, 20 years or less, which includes certain soft, which includes certain computer software, water utility property, and it also includes a couple of new categories, which is qualified film television production property and qualified life theoretical production property. Sadly, in the new tax reform, several types of 15 15 year recovery period were removed post December 31st, 2017, which includes qualified lethal improvements, qualified restaurant property, and qualified retail property. I want to highlight here, even though they were removed, the good thing is there's still qualified improvement property which still exists under the current tax law and is defined as the improvement that is made to the interior of the building after the original building was placed into service. However, it cannot be an elevator or escalator or an expansion and has to be non-structural in nature. Even though QIP still exists, it no longer has a favorable bonus treatment it had in, in preceding law. The new law removed it from the list of property of a specified type and then failed to add language clarifying the intended recovery period of 15 years. Therefore, QIP remains 39 year property, but it's no longer bonus eligible post 1231 2017. However, the proposed regs do confirm that QIP acquired after September 27, 2017 and placed in service before January 1st, 2018 is eligible for bonus depreciation, even though it's recovered over 39 years. There are certain types of property that are specifically excluded from bonus applicability. In certain situations where the taxpayer is required to use the alternative depreciation system, the bonus is not applicable. Example of this include property used outside the United States, tax-exempt use properties, and tax-exempt bond finance properties. 
also excludes it also excluded our property used in primarily in certain public trades or businesses and property used in a trade or business that has floor, finance, floor plan financing. These exclusions only apply to property acquired after 927-2017 and placed in service tax years beginning on or after December 1st, 2018. So let's look at some of the place and service requirements uh, to be eligible for bonus depreciation. In order to be bonus eligible, the property generally needs to be placed in service after 927-2017 and before January 1st, uh, 2023. When determining the place and service date, the new regs are generally the same as the former rules outlined in section 1.168K 1B5. With buildings that are constructed new, we normally look at the date of the certificate of occupancy. For acquired buildings, we look at the ready and available for use standard. Qualified film or television production is treated as placed in service at the time of initial release or, bro or broadcast as defined under section 1.181-1A7. And a qualified life theoretical production is treated as place and service at the time of initial live stage performance. Based on the proposed regs, the acquisition requirements of the effective date are addressed under section 13201H of the Act. The result is there are three basic types of projects. For existing acquired properties, the date the taxpayer enters into a written binding contract is the key for determining the applicable bonus rate. The regulations clarify that a letter of intent is not a binding contract. For tax purposes, a written binding contract is a contract that is enforceable under the state law where liquidated damages provisions can be 5% or more of the contract price. Real estate contracts that only limit damages to earned money that is less than 5% of the contract price will gener generally not meet this definition. We recommend that taxpayers consult with an attorney, attorney regarding the binding nature of the contract in these kind of situations. For new construction property that is manufactured, constructed, are produced for the taxpayer by a third party under written binding contract, the property as if this was acquired pursuant to a written binding contract, just like existing acquired property. For self-constructed property that is constructed by a taxpayer for its own use, the property is not considered acquired until the taxpayer begins manufacturing, constructing, or producing the property. An optional safe harbor allows the taxpayer to determine the effective acquisition date as the date when the 10% of the total construction cost has been incurred or physical work of significant nature has begun. Now let's look at how 1031 exchanges uh, take into effect as a bonus depreciation. There's been a lot of discussion in our industry about the impact of 1031 exchanges. Based on our understanding of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and the proposed regs, the cost segregation is still beneficial on both sides of the transaction. We believe there are no material changes regarding the interaction between cost segregation and 1031 exchanges for several reasons. Some of these reasons are, number one, committee reports suggest there is no intent to change the nature of 1031 transactions for real estate. Number two, personal property from cost segregation is still considered real property under the state law. And matching of the 1245 property is still required to avoid recapture. With respect to bonus depreciation, the bonus would only apply to the access basis in the replacement property. Now let's talk through some examples of how tax reform has affected um, 
the bonus depreciation. Suppose the taxpayer enters an agreement to purchase equipment on 8-1-2017 with a 25% penalty of restocking if the contract is canceled. If the equipment is delivered and installed on 10-1-2017, it would be eligible for 50% bonus treatment. Even though the place and service date was post 9-27, the taxpayer had a binding contract in place prior to 9-28, so it has to follow the old law. Now suppose a taxpayer begins the construction on the new interior improvements using a general contractor on 10-1-2017 with the, with the work completed and placed in service on January 15, 2018. In this case, the property is eligible for 100% bonus treatment because both the place in service date and the acquisition date are post September 27, 2017 or 9-27-2017. Now let's consider a taxpayer who signs a letter of intent to acquire a freestanding restaurant on June 1st, 2017, but the acquisition doesn't actually occur until November 1st, 2017, which the taxpayer promptly opens for business. In this case, the place and service date and acquisition date are post September 27, 2017 and prior to January 1st, 2018, allowing, allowing the entire structure to be considered as qualified restaurant property with a 15-year recovery period and 100% bonus treatment. Lastly, we have a taxpayer that begins construction on its own property on September 1st, 2017, or 9 one 2017 As of October 1st, 2017, only 8% of the total cost of the project had been incurred. Ultimately, if completed and placed in service on May 15, 2018. Since this is a self-constructed property and it's less than 10% of, of the self-construction was completed by 9-27-2017, it's considered acquired after 9-27. In this case, bonus eligible property will receive the 100% bonus rate. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act created a new limitation on bonus interest expense, which applies to all businesses, regardless of form, on the deductibility of net business interest expense that exceeds 30% of a taxpayer's adjusted taxable income. The good news is that the, ta the Act provides an exemption from the limitation on the inter interest deductibility for taxpayers other than tax shelters, whose Average annual growth receipts do not exceed $25 million for the three preceding taxable years. Taxpayers that are considered to be in real property trailer business have the opportunity to elect out of limitation on the interest expense deductions. However, the electing taxpayer is required to use the alternative depreciation system for the depreciable real property. The ADS recovery is for is 40 years for the commercial buildings and 30 years for residential rental property. Technically, qualified improvement property is currently 39 years, so it would go to 40 years under ADS. Once technical corrections occur, the QIP should be 15 year and the ADS recovery period for that will be 20 years. The result of a mandatory use of ADS is that bonus is not available to the taxpayer. Now let's look at section 179 um, in the light of the new tax reform. Section 179 allows businesses to deduct the cost of purchasing qualifying equipment and software. For 2018, the deduction limit has been increased to 1 million. The 2018 spending cap is set to 2.5 million, which means there's a dollar for dollar reduction in the 1 million deduction limit for every dollar that is spent in excess of 2.5 million. So let's say if there's a taxpayer who spends 3.5 million on 179 eligible property, they would eliminate their capacity to use the 179 expense. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act permits 179 expensing for roof, HVAC, fire protection, 
and alarm systems and security systems. This is only applicable to commercial buildings, not the residential. And it's only limited to improvements that are made after the building was first placed into service. Generally, the rules in Section 179 will also prevent non-corporate real estate investors from taking advantage of this 179 expensing treatment. So just to give you an example, suppose a client purchased an existing 10-year-old building in 2018 for 4 million. Before placing it into service, they put in a new roof, HVAC, fire protection, and security system for half a million. All are 179 eligible. Now you may be thinking, how can this be true since the improvements were done before the taxpayer placed the building into service? Remember, the key here is the building was originally placed into service 10 years ago by some other taxpayer, so the first place in service requirement I mentioned was actually satisfied. One seventy nine expensing now includes personal property used for furnishing lodging such as furniture and appliances in hotels, apartment buildings, and student housing. Something to, that, to consider is that there is no real benefit of taking 179 expense on tangible personal property that is already eligible for 100% bonus depreciation. Taxpayers should consider utilizing 179 expense on the items not otherwise eligible for bonus depreciation, such as roof and HVAC equipment. One thing to note is that 179 expense does make them subject to recapture. Now let's talk a little bit about net, op uh, net operating losses. Tax reform has made major changes to the utilization of net operating losses. The carryover and the carryback rules have changed and a new limitation on the NOL utilization has been added. Under the prior law, NOLs were generally eligible for a two-year carryback and 20-year carry forward. Further, NOL carryovers and carryback could fully offset the taxable income of a taxpayer if not otherwise limited under the Internal Revenue Code. Both of, those, both of those rules have now changed. The current law, this allows the NOL carryback, but allow the indefinite carry forward of those NOLs. In any given taxpayer, however, the NOL deduction cannot exceed 80% of the taxpayer pre-NOL deduction taxable income. These limitations on the use of NOL deductions only apply to NOLs generated after 2017, so this provided another motivation to maximize deduction associated with the 2017 tax return. Now let's look at cost aggregation and the estate planning, a little bit of its background. Cost aggregation is just a useful tool if, when you're doing estate planning. For the strategy, let's use, start with some basic rules. When a building owner dies and the property is inherited, that has appreciated any gains built up during the descendant's life are forgiven. Beneficiary receives a step up, which means the property tax basis is recessed to the fair market value. This provides an opportunity to do a cost aggregation study on the, descent, uh, on the descendant's pre-step basis and creating a permanent tax deduction. To illustrate this, let's look at the building purchased by a descendant in 2008, where the debt happens in August of 2015. Since the original investment of a million is considered residential rental property, it's depreciated over a long life of 27 and a half years. So by the time of the debt, the descendant will have roughly 728,000 of depreciation that he never got to deduct. The descendant will have will still need to have a final tax return prepared for the period in 2015 while he was alive. Now, supposing the descendant had sold the property for $2 million before they died, they would have had a taxable gain of $1.27 million. That doesn't happen in our situation, though, since the current, tax, the current estate tax rules forgive any taxable gain built up by the descendant. The beneficiary gets a full step up to the fair market value of the property on the date of the debt. In this case, in this, case this was $2 million. The beneficiary now now records the two million basis on their tax return going forward. Now most CPAs already know that it's a, it's a great idea to do a cost aggregation study on the two million step up basis, but many CPAs can overlook 
the time sensitive opportunity to apply cost segregation study on the pre stepped up basis, which allows the descendant to claim even more depreciation deductions before the debt. And it can, it can lower the building's tax base and create a higher step up to the fair market value. The idea is to take much depreciation before the debt since the heir gets the step up to the fair market value regardless of the decedent's basis. The strategy, the, the strategy typically yields the greatest benefits for the estate because these deductions would otherwise be lost forever if not taken on decent descendant tax uh, lost tax return. When we conduct a cost segregation study on the building of this 2008 purchase date, we identified we identify items in the building purchase size that should have been depreciated to the shorter tax life. In our case study, now let's look at in a case study, a cost segregation study identified 200K of things like cabinets, ceiling fans, appliances, related electrical, can be recategorized as five-year property. It also identified another 100K of things like parking lot, landscaping, et cetera. Since the descendant should have written off these items much quicker than 27 and a half year life, he used the since the descendant should have written off these items much quicker than 27 and a half year life, he used the IRS allows him to claim any missed deductions on his final tax return using uh, Form 3115. In our case study, when the descendant final tax return is filled along with the Form 3115, they claim the missed depreciation deductions of approximately 174,000. As discussed, this lowers the descendant's building tax basis, but that's okay since the heir gets a step up to the fair market value regardless of the descendant's basis. Because the deductions would have been lost forever, the result is a permanent tax savings of over 68,000. Now I mentioned that this needs to be done on a descendant's final tax return. That's because when a building is acquired in a, in a tax year prior to death, in order to apply cost segregation study, a 3115 is required and generally cannot be filled on an amended return. From the Harris perspective, they now get a step up the basis to the current fair market value and begin depreciation all over again. Since they have already had a retroactive cost segregation study done on the property, they can now have that study update to reflect the new fair market value step up basis at a minimal cost. This allows the heirs to maximize deduction on the new basis. Now let's, let's talk about a little bit about repair versus capitalization. The tangible property regulations were introduced in 2013 and, and effective for all taxpayers for all tax years beginning on or after January 1st, 2014. It provides rules for capitalize, capitalizing or expensing the cost incurred to acquire or produce tangible property. Generally, the rules distinguish the qualities of an expenditure that constitute as an improvement requiring capitalization and or depreciation. Improvements are defined as costs that result in a betterment to the unit of property, adapts the unit of property to a new or different use, or restores the unit of property. If any of these criteria are satisfied, the asset is an improvement and must be capitalized. First thing first, what is a unit of property? What is a unit of property? A unit of property is a component that are function functionally interdependent. Components are functionally interdependent if, if the placing and service of one component is depending on placing and service other components. The regulations for several Regulations provide a special unit of property rules regarding building. A building structure consists of a building and a structural components other than structural components designated as building systems and the tangible property regulations. Each building system is treated as a separate unit of property. So the 1250 property with the building should be segregated into following nine systems, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, escalators, elevator, and so on, and, and number nine being everything else. Over the first few years of my career, cost segregation studies mainly focus on identifying five, seven, and 15 year property within a building. Today, primarily due to the tangible property regs, the current cost study should be leveraged to provide more detail than ever. As illustrated in our slide, 
even the 39-year property needs to be segregated between the various building systems. The potential for deducting the current year repairs, retirements, and the removal cost should be considered. A cost aggregation study is a natural launch point for exploring all of these related opportunities because we are already working with many of the relevant data and we have an understanding of relevant facts and circumstances that affect these opportunities. Now let's look at some of these betterment examples. So in example one, we have replacing asphalt shingles with sh solar shingles. Obviously, solar shingles are going to be considered better than asphalt shingles. The determination may not be so easy when comparing two different types of asphalt shingles. So you need to have a good cost segregation provider in order to determine if it can really be taken as a repair expense or should be capitalized. In example two, let's say if you have an extensive renovations to an office space that adds offices and accommodate more employees. The key words for evaluating the office space modification are extensive, as, or more. These, these eject adjectives are all hint of a better. Asbestos removal is not a betterment. We, we see that asbestos removal is, not, is determined not to be a betterment. Asbestos can be contained in such a way that it's not considered a health risk. For removing, it is not materially making the building better. Now let's look at adaptation. The cost of adapting to a new use must be capitalized as an improvement. If the costs are incurred to, to be putting something to a new use, it has to be considered capitalized. In this example, the taxpayer is adapting the, the use of this manufacturing building to become a showroom. Since the change in use, the, co the cost must be capitalized. If the use were not being adapted and the same items were installed as a part of the manufacturing operation, the cost may have been eligible for treatment as a repair deduction instead. Now let's look at restoration. Replacing a major component that performs a critical function in the building would be considered restoration. However, the replacement of a minor component of a unit of property does not constitute a major component or a substantial structural part, even if it, even if it affects the function of the UOP or unit of property. Replacing a large portion of a building system would also be considered a restoration. In each case, this requires consideration of all facts and circumstances, both quantitative and qualitative, not just the cost, but the size, type, function, et cetera. So let's look at some of the examples for restoration. If we replace a, if we replace a chiller in our building and it only and it's only the chiller in the H, it's only one chiller in the HVAC system, then we essentially replace a major component that's performing a discrete and critical function because the system is in, inoperable without the chiller. However, on the other hand, if if the replaced chiller were one of the four chillers in the HVAC system, we might consider it a minor component and treat the cost as a repair expense. Now the current regulations allow you to take a loss deduction when you remove components from the building. So for example, if you pay $50,000 to replace all the HVAC units in your building with the new ones, you need to capitalize that amount. If $50,000 is then recovered over 39 years, however, now you can figure out how much, how much remaining basis is left in the old HVAC and claim that as an immediate deduction in the tax year this occurs. This can be done on a go-forward basis. Let's say if you acquired an existing building and do not know how to calculate the remaining basis in a component of the building, you may want to take advantage of our partial disposition calculator at the link on the slide. We created this tool for that very situation and it relies on the producer price index in conjunction with the other factors to estimate the remaining basis. Let's look at an example to see the impact this can have. Suppose the taxpayer acquired a building in 2010 for five million. In 2017, they spent one million to re remodel part of the second floor ceilings, walls, finishes, et cetera. We analyzed the original cost of de demolished components and discovered they, they represent close to 470,000 of the original five million, five million building basis. The taxpayer can now recognize a loss of 404,000 in 2017 taxpayer tax year because the original cost basis less depreciation already taken. Remember, you can only take advantage of this partial disposition in conjunction 
with a timely file of return. Otherwise, you miss the opportunity to recognize the retirement. Remember, retirements can create a permanent tax savings. So something to consider with respect to retirements. If you continue depreciating assets that could have, could have properly been retired, you will eventually pay the recapture tax upon sale of the property. So it's very important to um, take this into account. Recapture rates are the highest ordinary rates compared to the capital gain rate, gains rate. Let's look at our previous example where the taxpayer acquired the building in 2010 for $5 million and had a 470000 of retirement in 2017. If the taxpayer had not taken retirement deduction in 2017, they would have continued to depreciate over 470000 until the property sold one day and recapture will then be required. Let's say if they had 370000 of basis was 39-year property and the, and the other, other, other 100,000 was seven-year property, the recapture tax on the real property would be 370,000 times 25% added to the 100,000 times the 35% for the personal property. And that will give you a total recapture tax of close to 127,000. However, as a result of retirement study, the recapture tax is now zero. There is a capital gain tax on the 470,000 at 20% for a total of 94,000. So the net difference between 127,000 and the 94,000 is close to making a permanent tax savings upon the sale, close to 33,000. Prior to the tangible property regs, removal cost of an old component would generally have to be capitalized with the cost of the new component. However, in the current law, the removal cost can be deducted if a taxpayer retires the remaining basis and the old component was, was replaced. In our example, the landlord spent 200,000 on a leasehold improvement in each of the three tenant spaces in year one. Later in year five, a new tenant leases one of the spaces and requiring the landlord to completely demolish the leasehold improvements in that space and rebuilt into a tenant specification. The total spent was close to 240,000 of which 40,000 was for demolition. The old tenant for the old tenant to build out. In this scenario, the landlord can expense the 40,000 of the demolition cost and deduct the remaining basis of 200,000 for the cost of the build out. This is very significant. Prior to the TPR, to repair made, made to the building in conjunction with the larger rehab project had to be capitalized. However, if those repair and maintenance type costs were, were incurred because of the improvements, they can be expensed in the current year. So the question becomes, was the expense necessary to complete the improvement? And this example will, will, will give you a better answer. If a taxpayer sends 500K to re rewire the building that incurs 30K of cost to repair the drywall that was damaged in the process of those electrical upgrades, the total cost of 530,000 must be capitalized. However, if 30,000 driver repulse were drywall repairs were totally unrelated to the electrical work, it could potentially be expensed as a repair, assuming it meets all of the criteria for such treatment. Thanks to the TPRs, as I said, for if, you, if a tax for anticipates the future need to demolish a building, the building can be placed into a single asset in the GA along with depreciation to continue even after the building has been demolished. Later when the building is constructed and placed in service, the taxpayer will be able to take depreciation deductions on both demolished building and the GA account and, and the new building. However, there are two caveats that one needs to consider, keep in mind. The single asset GA election must be made during the year in which the property is acquired, and the election can be made if the building is acquired and disposed of in the same year. So keep in mind when, when you're considering about demolishing a building and considering taking a GA election. This is a snippet image of what we call a qualified improvement for a quick reference chart. This is available on our website, and many of our CPA clients love this chart and keep it handy. You should pass it out to, you know, to your staff, and even, even you know, they pass it out even to some of our clients. I'd encourage you to take a look at this and summarize everything, yes, pretty much summarize everything we talked about today in this webinar. As I bring this webinar to conclusion, I think it's important to mention there are significant differences among cost segregation advisors in the marketplace. Some, sometimes taxpayers aren't immediately aware of those differences may impact their experience. I've already mentioned the importance of using ASDST uh, group 
um, or, or a certified member to oversee the analysis, ask to see the resumes and the bios of the key people who are actually working in the, in the organization. You need to look at other things like if the advisor you're using or you potentially will be using demonstrate the thought leadership in the marketplace. Are they up to date with the current tax law and the trends? Are they aware of the property tax issues and energy tax incentives, repair versus capitalization, all these regulations? Make sure you choose a firm that you can trust who can help you even in, in a case of an audit. 